Welcome everyone to another stunningly exhilarating episode of Making Sense Online with my not good friend and colleague Dave Cormier. Dave, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, it's been uh, like for many people in, in our profession, whatever that is, uh, it's been a bit of a week. Uh, I think everybody's at that point now where they realize that we're not fooling around anymore. Uh, people are starting to get ready for the summer in earnest. People are some, in some cases, getting ready for the fall. And I think um, we're really at that pivot point where we're pivoting the pivot. I think this kind of feels like that week. I sent out a tweet, uh, a bemoaning tweet, a whinging tweet, you might call it, uh, on Wednesday morning. And it got liked about 550 times by other uh, people in education and technology who are like, yep, that's what my life is like right now. So I kind of feel like that, that we're really getting into it now. The panic is starting to subside yeah. and this we're in it for the long term. We're going to have to do some real planning is starting to kick in. Yeah. That's been, I think uh, a reality for, for a lot of people who have initially been called on. And this is people say in your position, people like Justin and Matt and Tanya and, you know, group individuals and organizations who have the knowledge who have the ability to help move organizations online and teaching and learning practices online. And in many cases, we touched this briefly earlier, but they haven't had people knocking on their doors asking for their services. You've been kicking and screaming and dragging faculty to your workshops. And all of yep. a sudden you are the most popular kid in class. And it, it really, it, it's great because you finally have people listening, but it's not great because you don't have institutional capacity to help everyone at the level that they need help. So here's a question I have for you about this, George, and you're like, I can't imagine a better person to ask because- No, you I can ask me anything. Nice I'm a you. great person to ask all of your questions to. I hate to say nice things about you into your face, but I don't know anybody who has a more encyclopedic knowledge of education and its intersection with technology than you do. The claim that I've been making recently, unfounded, obviously, because you're the researcher, not me, is that a lot of, because of that very thing, that the people who are coming to us now are not the people who have ever come to us before. What we used to get was the coalition of the willing. They were the people who are interested. We would coach them along. We would do a blended course with them first, maybe, and they would do one activity online. We would slowly get to the point where they would teach online. With the exception, certainly, um, there are some of your colleagues who are complaining online that they've been doing this for years and getting people online very, very quickly. They've been getting a couple people online, not hundreds at a time. And those people who they were getting online were either of low status and had been forced to go online by somebody, or they were people who were excited by the prospect, right? We have not been forcing our star researchers to go online and teach online courses. That has not been happening. And maybe once, but it doesn't happen. Suddenly now, even the star faculty on campus are being told, no, no, like literally you're going to have to do this now. So my suggestion is that the existing research that we have about this is really not going to apply or not apply the way that we would like it to because the audience is so fundamentally different. These people would have never been part of the research projects before. They were not the people that we were working with before. So I wonder what your feelings are about that. And that's, that's an insightful point. And I think you're, you're right because, and it's a little bit of an argument we've tried to make in this course. So some, not everybody who's you know, watched this later is taking the course, but we tried to take a research informed perspective on what we know about teaching and learning in online settings or in distance or digital education environments. Much of that research assumes a few basic things. It assumes that people are not in the middle of a global pandemic. That's sort of like a base assumption. Weird, you know. And the, and the thing is, most research articles don't declare that as a limitation first. Right. They really should say, my thoughts on the effective use of media and education are based on non-pandemic settings. But anyway, so that's the first <laughs> point. It's not, that's, that's not the environment. Secondly, you are absolutely right. They're, these are individuals who have either intentionally selected to do this, they've got perhaps a research grant to test, which means they've designed and they've studied it. More recently, there's been a number of people through the learning analytics lens that have turned their attention to this. But even then, you're dealing with a non-forced population. And so we're, we're very much in this uh, kind of a setting right now where it's like, well, what, what do we learn from existing research that we can apply to the current setting? I would say what we're experiencing and have been experiencing for four weeks and will experience for who knows another, at least this semester, there's not an awful lot that's applicable. I think when we tried to say this earlier on, which is 
be kind, be connected, be considerate, try and reach out, care. be passionate, all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what is applicable come fall? That's going to be an interesting one to assess because it's whole scale online that we, we don't know. And one of the interviews we had with Harriet Watkins a couple of weeks ago, she talks about how she went to Arkansas and moved an entire university online and what that experience was like. There's an interesting intersection there because you have to be both pragmatic and practical, yeah. but you also have to still draw as much as you can on research. But I do think this is a marking point for digital learning, online learning research, much like the development of edX and Coursera brought a lot of computer scientists into the uh, digital learning space and the research that. in the digital learning space. But much of it was walking territory that had already been discovered. So uh, yes, um, as a follow-up question to that, and this is another concern that I have looking forward. So when we start talking about that fall, so my tweet yesterday really brought this into focus to me, just how tired this group is already. So we're five, six weeks into this at this point, in some cases, a little bit longer, a little bit less, depending on where you live. But that planning for September has to be done by somebody. And I know that there's an awful lot of noise right now about people shutting down their shops and sending out their online learning to OPMs, which I don't think any of us prefer as an option. Um, but if we burn out all of the Justins and you know, all the people who like Tanya, the people like uh, Rajiv, who I was talking to uh, earlier today, who is running at full tilt and is going to be running at full tilt for months. If we burn all these people out, what is, who is going to be doing that core administrative work that's required to make the kind of transitions you're talking to? So it's, it's difficult to do good pragmatic work when you're in a hurry, right? Is it fast, cheap, and good? Like, there's only so much of it you can get done. And I just wonder who is going to be out there waiting to pounce and who is going to get these contracts to make the decision and what's going to happen to higher ed coming fall when this happens. Uh, that's a, I mean, who knows? And, and it'll likely be different in different institutions. So, for example, the, uh, there's a lot of aggrieved individuals in ed tech right now who... Yes. they've been speaking for years within their teaching and learning centers or within their, you know, open education departments, trying to get an ear of people who are, you know, faculty or leadership to say, we need resources, we need support, we need these tool sets available, we need uh, research or a learning design informed approach to moving stuff online. And so, but they are often not positioned. Uh, I use the word sort of at the power table, but um, yeah. whenever I use that with Kate, Goals, she says there is no table uh, but so I'll call it the power network the people who make decisions and these are individuals that typically aren't there like they, they don't they're, they're not directly speaking to the provost and not directly influencing that which means much of that voice hasn't been heard now all of a sudden you have a group that's been a little bit pushed to the side in some institutions yeah. or at least been underutilized they're the people who theoretically at least sort of know what should be done but they don't have the positioning in the organization to make that happen. And so that's why I think you will see a, a rise in OPM adoption by university leaders, because it's that old statement, nobody ever got fired for buying Microsoft. And in the same regard, if you bring someone in who is an expert at what they do, you don't have to worry about institutional capacity at the same level. You don't have to deal with all the stuff about navigating, you know, contracts or whatever else internally that you need to do. There's a safe approach that you can adopt and move forward. So my or my concern, I think, is that the people who are in the know, the ed tech people, are not positioned organizationally to influence the decisions that need to be made. And so as a result, there will be a lot of OPMing that will happen. Now, OPM can work well for certain settings. It's helped many universities develop, you know, develop online programs that result in hundreds of millions of dollars in tuition. Unfortunately, it is kind of giving away your core thing. It's like what you do is kind of, if Boeing goes out and says, you know what, we need to find somebody to build our airplanes for us. Then I'm like, well, what are you guys gonna do? Like, what's your role in all this if somebody else is building your airplane? So that's sort of my issue a bit with, with that, but, um, so to be argumentative here, just to push the argument a little further, if they have not been in those administrative positions, would you also say that they don't have the experience to know how to leverage power and those networks that they're suddenly being thrust into? 
Oh, absolutely. And I, I absolutely think that they haven't been in those positions. They don't have the ability, well, they may have the ability in some cases, but it requires a unique set of dynamics to be able to navigate things organizationally, to be able to ensure you don't tick off this person who is going to be critical for that functionality later on. And I know you've got experience with this because you've been navigating those cycles for years, but I do think ed tech personnel have the capability. Some may have vision, but I don't think there's, you know, necessarily that vision is prominently there at an institutional level because they're often focused on, you know, smaller problems of course development, of course, initiate, yeah, and solutions. They don't necessarily have the leadership background to be able to make that happen. Some institutions, I mean, you get a person years ago, like, you know, say Tony Bates at, from UBC, you know, he was well positioned, or Randy Garrison from University of Calgary, because they're a senior academic leading those groups. That's a little different, but that's often not the case. They're, these yeah. positions, departments have generally not been positioned that way. Now, Amy Matt, Collier is a good example. Rajiv Janjani is another good example of people now. Yeah, so there are, there are people here and there, but the norm isn't, that's not the norm. That Many are not as centrally positioned organizationally or led by uh, a senior academic who's going to get the voice of other or the attention of other faculty. But you've got a good story in your case in that you have sort of moved through organizations in a way that you've both led, you've both helped be lead curriculum development teams, media development teams, but you've also served a strategy lens. What's yeah. made that successful for you? Um, I think um, under, it's, it's, it's about code switching, right? You have to understand the difference between what the IT team is looking for and where they're coming from, what the CTL team is looking for, where they're coming from. And then you have to understand the, the struggles that the senior administration team is in, right? So there are not a lot of people in this process who are actually trying to do a shitty job. Like everybody has their perspective. And I understand where the faculty are trying to hold their lines in terms of what it means to be a faculty member. But I also understand that if there's no money in the budget, you can't pay people. And the lights have to be paid for. And you have to, and I understand that, you know, a president's job in a lot of cases is just about fundraising. Right, and we think of them as having different roles, but they're interested in in making sure that the university gets a different kind of money, and they're on a totally different plane in terms of what they're trying to get done. In a lot of cases, you know, we've got university presidents, uh, much like say Congress in the United States, that most of their job is actually fundraising, and what we see is that little bit of the time when they're turned out when they're when they're forward facing, but most of the time they're in the background trying to dig money out of corners to try to keep the place up and running. And I think it's it's an understanding of all those different perspectives and then trying to, much like grant writing, you can grant write in two different ways. One, you can have an idea and then look for a grant, or you can look at the grant and write to the grant, right? And adjust your ideas so that you can still kind of get what you want done, but towards the actual grant that's being presented. And it's that latter approach that's going to be successful. Does it allow you to maintain the same level of idealism? No, frankly, it doesn't. And I don't have the same level of idealism that I had 20 years ago. But those idealistic projects died and I got tired of them dying. So I just started getting involved in a different conversation so that I could be involved in the change process, make changes, maybe 20% of the change I wanted instead of 0% of the change I wanted or worse. And this is where I think educational technology, broadly speaking, I know that term is a contentious one, but the people who are involved at the intersection of technology and education where the we're still we're still victimized by the mistakes we made 25 20 and 15 years ago where we told people that we had solutions that would work and they simply didn't um, and they gave people more work than they had before and in a lot of cases um, we didn't know enough about project management to put in the supports that would actually allow those people to succeed and we believe what I think is the absolute worst model for change. And we're seeing a lot of it right now, which is that idea of champion based changed change, right? So we look to the people who are the superstars and try to model what they do, but those people work hundred hours a week and they have maybe 20 years of experience and that's the wrong model, right? What you need is something that is effective that can be done by normal people that can be done repeatedly and that fits the person who is actually involved in the change. Well, that's, I think the point that you were, uh, you know, raising earlier about some of the people in these institutions that are capable of doing it, but 
let's say the U.S., you've got thousands of higher education institutions. If you and I were to sit down and rattle off a name of, you know, just quickly at the top of our head, people who we know are leading, you know, you mentioned Amy Collier and others that are- Kenya. Really, pardon me? Tanya Justin. Tanya Justin and a, and a range of others. I, who's Tanya, by the way? Tanya? No, I'm just kidding. No, I, literally. Do you have a preference? No, I actually I had a chat with her. Do I call her Tanya or Tanya? And I think one meeting I went back and forth about six times and she like, <laughs> I really don't care. So anyway, um, so one of the things that, that with people like that, there's a few, but the vast majority of institutions don't have a Tanya on faculty and they don't have that support level. So that means they're not, they're, they're, they don't have the leadership they, that they need to necessarily make that kind of a, a transition. With that said, so now we know at minimum, ed tech is critical. The ed tech departments, whatever you want to call it, they are not organizationally positioned to make the kind of impact that they need to make. Generally speaking, there's a few exceptions. There is a lack of vision in many instances because they've been focused on granular sort of specific solution getting rather than broader vision creating because they haven't been asked to do that organizationally. And I think that's going to start to become more pronounced going forward because there's a lot of people that are going to need to sort of, uh, you know, hike up their resolve and start to become professionals at communicating at a C level organizationally in the university level, something that they haven't been asked to do in the past. And, and that's where the work of people like Martin Weller and the work that he's doing right now at OU, where he's having these sort of sit down counseling sessions with people at large inside of the field inside of the UK are so critical. So to me, it's that time where people who have Martin's experience, he's been in that shop for 25 years, He's been running that shop for a long time. He's been at the senior table for a long time. Was he sitting down with people? Wouldn't you say? What's that? A bit curmudgeonly, wouldn't you say? I love that guy. He just came onto my nice video today and says lots of nice things. Yeah, Yeah. he did. He was really great. Um, uh, He didn't comb his hair, though, which was like... You know what? That's a UK thing. The Brits, they're like, you know what? Who cares? But I, I really think the problem is, is that those people right now don't have the time to do this. So while it would be fantastic. Known, to get- so here's the other thing is, are they even known, right? So one of the things I've found in the uh, sort of the space that Martin and, and many others uh, play in, I mean, Alison Littlejohn's another colleague out of UK. Yeah, that's, you know, for fantastic sure. Fantastic in this space. Um, the, the, these are people who are very known within this network that, that you and I are aware of, but outside of it, it's, they don't necessarily have that recognition because their literature has almost zero overlap with other domains. Another, I was thinking about this this week, like who the hell is going to help senior leadership in universities around the world move into the space that they need to move into? Is it going to be ed tech? My answer is no. For a number of reasons we've already It's going to be Deloitte. Well, see, thank you for that. So, and then the second thing I was thinking about, is it going to be learning sciences? Because there's an enormous parallel field that has made a big impact uh, that, that we don't, in, in the sort of the ed tech space, don't appeal to enough, but that's the learning Are science. you talking about the learning engineers? No. Well, they're, they're no, learning science, I'm talking about the, the group that, it, they do have a CMU connection, but there's an, many of them come more from a humanities uh, or a, uh, education slash whatever background. So learning sciences as a field. Now there is learning engineering. That's an entire, we'll talk about that a different day, Dave. So if it's not the ed tech and it's not the learning sciences community, is it learning analytics? Well, again, no, I don't think it is because they don't think strategically and organizationally. So who is going to provide leadership and guidance to provosts and presidents to make that transition? Well, I think, you know, it's going to be McKinsey. It's going to be Deloitte because for some reason we haven't, developed our capability to speak at that level. Would you agree with that? I, I do, totally. I mean, I, I, I've sort of tried to self-teach myself how to do this so that I could be involved in those conversations because I wanted to be able to impact them. But I mean, I'd be interested in whether or not you think the work that Eddie Maloney and Josh Kim is doing would direct us in that, in that would bring us in that direction. Because that's really what they've been on about, is that there isn't a field of higher education. And with a lack of a field of higher education, like a self-reflexive field, a self-reflexive, a reflexive field uh, that allows us to process these educational issues that we don't have a group to point to and say, hey, how about those guys? So I'm going on to, t- I'm talking to Alex Usher tomorrow about online learning and the impact of COVID-19, right? And so he asks me, 
I have this other project I want to do. Who should I talk to? And I ring off a bunch of names, yours included. And, uh, but I realized that he doesn't know these. Well, I mean, he knows who you are because you guys have talked before, but the people I'm mentioning, somebody who is in Canada, who is the premier person to talk to about higher education and its trends really doesn't have, he wouldn't know who Amy is or who those people are, unless he's created a relationship with them on Twitter and he is very engaged in that way, but he is alone in the people who would know those people. Like there's just no, there's That's, like- a, So Ronald Burt in, in uh, Network Theory, um, and he has this concept, he calls them structural holes. And so it's that, that networks can be tightly connected and be very high performing in their own regard. But you also have structural holes that exist where if you fill that structural hole, you have an amplification of both networks because it could oh, be, interesting. let's say what you're saying right now, there's the cluster that Alex is in and Alex writes about policy and the economic side of the house better than I think anybody in Canada does in this I regard so. and for sure. very high quality outputs. Then there's an entirely different group over here that is doing good work in their own area and we'll, we'll keep using that very loose word of ed tech because it's the teaching and learning group and whoever else. Yeah. They maybe don't read Alex because Alex is more policy focused than they've been. And Alex may not be aware of who some of those leaders are in that space. Now, so there's a structural hole between the two, which means that there's almost no communication going on. And if you manage to find a way to, to address those structural holes, you have an amplification of insight across both of those self-contained network right. systems. So I think that's what is needed, but it still gets back to it. And I, we are gonna have to grapple with this. And I'm glad you raised this, this topic here because in the long run and by long run, I'm not talking years, I'm talking months. No, no it's like the next few months. Yeah. I want someone to tell me who is going to guide senior leadership through this because so far the players that we have here are not the ones that are going to do it. One is too focused on problems. One is too focused on research. One is too focused on, you know, whatever else. So it's, it, it's going to be an interesting cycle. No, now we're we got, super lucky. So what? We're super lucky at our institution because my director, the director of open learning, Nick Baker, is actually positioned in the institution where they call him and ask his advice. Mm -hmm. And Nick has been in the field for years and does understand um, where, the, where the issues are. So when they say, hey, Nick, what do you need? That's the question they're asking. They're not asking yeah. and, and the question that you want them to ask is not just how do I move a course online? The question is how do we make learning remain an effective experience for students while creating our longer term potential to continue to serve the needs of students in the future? Now you mentioned earlier, you know, a few, few individuals, Josh Kim and, and Malone, you know, and others that are yep. in this area. Um, they, there are individuals who are or have been involved early on with innovation projects. University of Michigan, Duke is another example of universities that pushed strongly in 2011 as there was this sort of move to online in the form of scale. They pushed strongly in that area. And these universities have since built up, I think, a significant organizational capacity to be able to serve their their population. Yeah. Uh, UPenn is another one. I mean, they've, they had for years, they've got like a hundred and some uh, instructional designers uh, that are available institutionally, whereas some systems have like one. And know, it's amazing. And the reason that UPenn's able to do it with their global campus and other initiatives that they started doing in the late nineties, they've created significant institutional capacity. Michigan, since they started with their Coursera and eventually edX projects, and I think they're with FutureLearn too now, they've developed significant institutional capacity. But even then, it's one thing to have technical and procedural capacity, it's quite another to be able to shape and guide the vision for what does it mean? No doubt we're dealing with, and we said this earlier, it's not a weeks and months problem, it's a months and years problem that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to, to address the question you asked earlier in terms of like, what is it, what's required in this conversation? If you just look at the word quality in a classroom, one, you're gonna be negotiating that word different with every individual group that you talk to. So when you look at the quality issue for the courses that are gonna be launched this summer, there is the student retention conversation, right? There is the student alumni conversation. So students stick in the program, but don't end up liking it. That has long-term effects down the road. There is the ability of international students to participate inside your course and people from outside of district to come in to your program and all the things that are required around there. There's the housing issues. Like how are we gonna get people from away to have a place to live? 
there is the student stress and support issue that involves the student services group. Like there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle right now. Part of the answer to that is good pedagogy, right? But you need to be able to pitch that good pedagogy. So pedagogies of care is hey, really I'm important. Gonna just, I'm going to dive in again just for the heck of it. Who gives a shit about pedagogy right now, Dave? Why you tell me as a faculty member why I should listen to pedagogy-ish people? Uh, the faculty don't have to. The only reason for faculty to do good pedagogy is so that you can potentially enjoy this experience more than you would otherwise. Um, good pedagogy leads to more interesting responses from your students. Like if you wanted, if you want to have like a reasonable experience, but the way that faculty contracts are, are written in most cases, there's there's no reason for them other than actually you know liking their field for them to do anything. There really isn't. Um, I haven't seen a lot of that resistance personally, but yeah. they have to choose. See, that's the point I'm trying to get at is, is the idea of teaching with technology as a craft, I don't mm -hmm. think is understood in the institution in many cases by many faculty, especially ones that have large populations sort of, of old school uh, educated faculty, right? The, the often computer science, engineering, or some of those areas where you, you knowledge teaching, learning is what you learned when you were uh, in the 1960s as a student, and this is how you do it, which means you don't respect the practice of teaching with technology as a craft. Necessary. Teaching is fundamentally, for many, the process of weeding out people who don't belong. Yeah. yeah exactly. so like if you don't even have that as a foundational premise, your institution 100% does not want you weeding out students. Yeah. They do not want you to do it. It is bad in every way. Yeah. Um, you have every time a student drops from five courses to three courses, the institution loses money. Every time you stress them out and put them in the student services, you raise the weight on that student service infrastructure. Every time you do something bad to your students, it has a ripple effect to the entire institution. And yet there are many faculty and people supporting faculty that I've talked to in the last five weeks who keep running into the same issue of, well, no, actually I am the threshold. Yeah. Like, so I had a friend of mine who is a long PhD, long since PhD, who is now in, in his field was saying, well, isn't that what universities are for? Aren't we trying to weed out the people who aren't smart enough? And I was like, well, see, and that's, and we got to wrap up here, but I mean, that is a, a, a prominent mindset. I agree. And, and that's, you know, I think the point I'm trying to make with that is that the argument from a sort of pedagogical end needs to be because if somebody's sitting there panicking getting stuff online the question isn't necessarily how do i teach well it's how do i function but they do have to shift to the pedagogy side of the house how do i make the machine go ping yeah right which is understandable everybody if we if our situation if we're fortunate in that this is a domain that we have some experience with but if something happened that resulted in us being totally unmoored from any understanding that we have here where we had to rely very heavily on another group to give us some direction we would be yeah. equally sort of confused and overwhelmed absolutely but at the end of the day you do need to start your digital teaching and learning practices with a lens on well teaching and learning and and it as a craft all right, we're at the end of the time here. Final words, Dave. Uh, yeah, everybody resists the, the, the pedagogy over the technology in the first meeting you have with them. What I have seen here and what I've seen bear out in other people's experience is by the second and third and fourth time, the majority of people start to go, oh, what you're talking about is actually complex. Now I get it. And then things are fine. Yeah. So to me, if, there's, if anybody has made it to the end of this and there are actually people involved in this process, Stick your guns. Is my yeah, yeah it's, it's like you're laying a solid foundation that, ha that you know, you have to focus on what's the most important thing over time that will have the biggest impact. And that's going to be uh, the teaching learning technology as a craft argument. All right. Thanks, Dave. Good to chat. Cheers, buddy. Great to talk as always.